And we're very pleased to welcome all of you to the ninth annual Robert H. Kirshner, MD, Human Rights Memorial Lecture. Thanks to the Kirshner family and friends for their support of this wonderful year-end event, which embodies Bob Kirshner's legacy of the human, as a founder of the Human Rights Program. Bob's legacy is that critical analysis of human rights problems can inform decisive action, which is a trait that he carried out through his illustrious career as an international forensic pathologist. I want to welcome the provost, Eric Isaacs. We're very pleased to uh, welcome you in your first year as provost to this event. Our human rights faculty who are here, our University of Chicago colleagues from various departments and schools and institutes who collaborate with us on many events, and our community partners, human rights activists who are here, and students, and especially alumni. We want to thank CAN TV for covering this event for cable and online viewers. This program is being cable cast live on CAN TV channel 27 and is streaming live at cantv.org slash watch. So if your friends are texting you from outside that they couldn't get in, it's cantv.org slash watch. They can keep up with us online. This event is also co-sponsored by the International House Global Voices Program, and I want to give a special thank you to the staff of International House for helping us bring off this very large event. I want to draw your attention to tonight's program, which lists the accomplishments of our students. We have listed the winners of the Ignacio Martin Barro Human Rights Essay Prize, which is named after an alumnus of the University of Chicago, a social psychologist who was a Spanish Jesuit professor at the, Nash at the Central American University in El Salvador when he and seven of his colleagues were assassinated by the Salvadoran military in 1989. Bob Kirshner went immediately to San Salvador to assist the Jesuits in examining the bodies and analyzing the murders. We also have the Dr. Isaac Wolf Human Rights Post Baccalaureate Fellowship, which this year is being held by Julius Isaac, who's working with the Native American Lands Conservancy in California. And then two new initiatives supported by the generosity of our donors, Richard and Ann Posen, Posen Research Grants for PhD students, which help students early in their careers do research that's necessary to develop a dissertation project focused on human rights. And the first Posen Human Rights Dissertation Completion Fellowship, which assists a, a, a doctoral student who is just about done with their PhD to have a year of uninterrupted work to actually get the dissertation written, a very hard task. And then I also want to mention the list in your program of the 2014 graduates who had human rights internships. The internships are, are supported by the School of Social Service Administration, the college, and alumni donors as part of the university's program, particularly supported in the college, to provide paid summer internships so that all students can have interesting and marvelous experiences regardless of their family's capacity to support them during the summer. And last but not least, and those of you who are alumni will really understand this, we're very proud of our human rights minors. We're very proud that human rights for the last five years has been a minor in the college, an accepted part of the core program and not just a sort of fashion of the month. Um, I would like to get applause for all of our students who are being honored. And then I have one more um, note about this evening's program, which is that there will be a reception that is both going to be out in the courtyard and in the lounge of I House, catered by our friends at Panivino, after this program. But to the disappointment of many of you, Paul Farmer has another engagement this evening, and he will only be able to be at the reception until 8.30. So I just wanted to not blow his reputation as being one of the most accessible and interested in everybody um, human rights rock stars that you would meet, but give his apologies in advance that he can't stay for the entire reception. So we appreciate your patience and tolerance. Um, I'd like to now hand over the podium to Michael Geyer, University Samuel N. Harper Professor of History, who has been the faculty director of the Human Rights Program for the last five years.
So I would like to welcome everybody to the two, uh, 2014 Kirchner Human Rights Memorial Lecture. Uh, Susan mentioned I'm the faculty director of the Human Rights Program. This is the last year of, in my tenure as faculty director and I'm joining uh, Susan to thank Dr. Barbara Kirchner and the Kirchner family for underwriting this lecture, which is in the name of Barbara's late husband, Bob Kirchner, eminent forensic pathologist and founding member of the Human Rights Program. On a personal note, I might add, we miss him very dearly in the program. Uh, uh, I also would like the occasion uh, to thank Susan Shesh, uh, the Executive Director of the Human Rights Program, uh, for organizing uh, uh, this event as every year, and Tara Peters, who actually did the, the handiwork. But I'm up here, really, uh, to beg your patience uh, for just a very few moments before we, we begin tonight's program. You can deduce uh, from the person I am introducing, uh, Eric Isaacs, uh, the provost of the University of Chicago, that this is an extraordinarily exciting and game-changing moment for the human rights program. To be very brief, let me just say that Professor Isaacs has a PhD from MIT and is a professor of physics at the University of Chicago. He was director of the Argonne National Laboratory from 2009 to 2013 and has done distinguished work in the field of material physics, especially nanoscale materials at Argonne and Bell Labs. He was introduced, and this is the point, as the new provost just this past December and has begun working in his new capacity only this spring term. He succeeds Tom Rosenbaum, who for the past six years has been a staunch supporter of the human rights program before leaving for Caltech. In turn, the human rights program has had and continues to have quite a few undergraduate students specializing in physics and, bio and or biology pre-med among its minors. Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Isaacs will speak in a second, but let me introduce then the introducer to the real program, and this is uh, the, the talk uh, of uh, 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 Paul Farmer. Uh, so after Provost Isaacs' announcement, Professor Hans Sossi uh, will introduce our main speaker of the evening, Dr. Paul Farmer. Professor Sossi uh, has only recently joined the University of Chicago from Yale University, and he is in that class of university professor to which we elevate our most distinguished colleagues. He is professor of comparative literature. His main field of scholarship is Chinese liter uh, literature and aesthetics, and more generally, poetry. He is one of more than 20 faculty members on the board of the Human Rights Program. And I think there is very good reason why he should be introducing our main speaker tonight, and he will surely tell us about it. But for the moment, let me welcome Provost, uh, uh, Provost Isaacs. I think you will very much like uh, uh, what he will have to say. So good evening, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this, this lecture. And I particularly, particularly want to welcome uh, our student awardees. So welcome and congratulations. Uh, since 1997, the Human Rights Program has attracted and trained some of the college's most intellectually ambitious scholars. The program educates them to infuse their leadership roles into society with a global perspective on social justice issues. Uh, the record is outstanding, and many of you who are here probably know that record, but in the last five years alone, the program has produced four Rhodes Scholars, two Truman Scholars, and a Marshall Scholar, and that's only in five years. It's got two very important features to it. One, of course, is because of the program, because of that program here, we're attracting the best and brightest students, but also those students go out with the DNA of human rights in them, and really, whatever field they choose, they have human rights in their body. Moreover, there is no other program in our peer institutions that compared to this one, 
in working with students in our PhD programs and professional schools, and in addition to developing scholars whose research advances the academic study of human rights. These students in a range of fields are also taking leadership roles in national and international human rights and humanitarian organizations. So of course, none of this, none of the things that you see here tonight or for the past years have, it would have been possible without exceptional and committed leadership. So I first want to thank our outgoing faculty director, Michael Geyer, for his seven years of great leadership. Please join me in thanking Michael. And I'd also like to, to thank Susan Zesh, she's already been thanked a few times, but for her work as executive director, so please join me in thanking Susan. Now about a month ago when Michael said he was stepping down, left me with, in my first month of being provost with the problem of replacing him, I charged the committee, and believe it or not, that committee in very short order came up with a name, uh, uh, someone who they really respected and, and they thought would carry on this program in, in only the best possible way. Uh, and it's really, I'm very pleased to announce, if he hasn't already announced to everyone already himself, uh, that Mark Bradley has agreed to be uh, the next faculty director of this program. So I, I do want to thank you, Mark, for taking on this job. It is very important to the university and to me personally as provost. Uh, but also, I want to thank the committee for their fast work. It's very unusual to get a bunch of faculty to work that quickly on anything. So, so, um, so, so I do also want to say that developing a program like this, of, of this kind of significance, takes another kind of leadership, uh, not only from our faculty and our staff, but it also really requires exceptional leadership and support from our friends and alumni. And so uh, it's really a, a pleasure for me to, to uh, hear college alumnus Richard Posen and his wife Anne are both here with us tonight and have traveled from their home in Bethesda, Maryland, and really appreciate them having, having them here. Uh, Richard and Anne uh, have been partners to the Human Rights Program since 2001, uh, early days. In addition to regular and substantial gifts to underwrite the operating costs of the center, uh, and Richard and Anne have also provided sustaining gifts to support the Posen Visiting Professorship in Human Rights and the Richard and Ann Posen New Leaders Odyssey Scholarship Fund in Human Rights. The work to date, it simply could not have been possible without these, uh, their leadership and these fellowships. I'm actually one of the reasons we're here and very pleased to announce that tonight that Richard and Ann, along with their children, Jonah and Alexis Posen, have now made a gift to further enhance the Human Rights Program uh, and to ensure it will continue to fuel our aspirations for generations to come. With their most recent gift, they bring their total gifts to support human rights at the University of Chicago to $7.5 million. And I think I'll stop here, because I think we deserve a round of applause. Thank you. So I am pleased to announce that as of today, uh, in recognition of their generosity, the Human Rights Program will be now be known as the Posen Family Center for Human Rights. It's a great name. Um, so I'd like to also thank them again. Thank you. So I can think of no better uh, place for this gift. We have countless examples at this university of those who have made contributions to human rights. So many of you out in the audience are thinking, what would a physicist know about human rights? So I just want to counter that argument. Uh, it turns out that Nobel Prize winner Owen Chamberlain, who many of you may know, who is a student of Enrico Fermi, one of the great physicists at the University of Chicago, and went on to discover the anti-proton. Um, he was also a tireless advocate for human rights issues, in particular working for the release of physicists in prison for their political beliefs in the 1950s. Uh, another scientist, Robert Kirchner, who's, who we're honoring here tonight, uh, whose life and work we honor with this annual lecture, was a, a pathologist and a pediatrician whose scientific work became the foundation for his own work in human rights. And I'm sure that in the audience now, I'm hopeful and also sure, that at least one of you, particularly our students, their awardees maybe tonight, who will be regarded for the rigorous analysis of your scholarship, thanks to this center, and we expect that you will also one day be known for your informed activism. So we're looking forward to the years to come. So we have strong leadership from our faculty, strong partnerships with our friends and alumni, and a strong history and a preeminence as the nation's leading academic human rights program based in the liberal arts. And I am confident that this center, newly named, will continue to bring together faculty uh, from across the university and the insights of many uh, disciplines to help meet the challenge of fully and fully understanding the venerable tradition of human rights and to articulate in a globally interconnected world. 
So I look forward to the impact of the Posen Family Center. We'll have in terms of two things, A, a new research questions that faculty and students alike will undertake in this relatively new field, and B, the expanding influence of its curriculum, a model of education for liberal arts institutions nationally and globally, and then the third, the dialogue that it can inspire and sustain between scholars and practitioners, something very important that it's great to do scholarship, but also we want to deliver that scholarship in the name of great practice. So in conclusion, I want to thank Michael again for his, his outstanding leadership. I will say that, uh, that there will be a conference next spring in his honor uh, to celebrate his work and all the great work he's done here, so we look forward to that and almost a year off, and I know Mark, look forward to help, Mark looks forward to helping organize that. And finally, I want to thank the Posens again for their visionary investment in the university and all of your interest in, and contribution to the advancement of human rights at the University of Chicago. So thank both of you very much. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Kirshner Memorial Lecture. I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight, a direct acknowledgement of the significance of our human rights program and a hint that our benefactor's generosity has not been totally misplaced. The questions examined in the human rights program are among the most serious questions raised in a university. And I would say that for us specifically in this country, with our history and assumptions, the area of health and human rights has the greatest power to change the way we see ourselves and others. For many of us of Paul's and my generation growing up in the US, the first time we heard about human rights as a field of activism was in connection with the denial of people's rights to free speech and assembly, their right to emigrate, their right to seek redress, their implicit right to representative government. And we learned about this in the context of the Cold War, when it seemed self-evident that people in some part of the world benefited from the recognition of those rights, while people lacked them in many other parts of the world. Not only the Soviet bloc in China, but also Latin America, Asia, and Africa, where the client states of the great powers all seemed to repress their dissidents with the greatest indifference. Of course, it wasn't a simple matter. The response to human rights activism by official representatives of the socialist countries and by some of our own homegrown leftists was to point out how inequitably the market system distributed such basic goods as food, housing, education, and medical care, goods which it was implied were a fair trade for civil and legal rights. The funny thing about this answer is that it was taken just as a rebuke of the West's hypocrisy. Despite some laudable exceptions, we did not experience, even in the Carter era, which made such a noise about making human rights the driving force of our foreign policy, uh, we did not experience a large-scale effort to wrap social and economic rights around the uncontestable but rather abstract goods of free speech and fair elections at home. The struggle for civil rights and equality within the US which had concluded in the courts with a handful of imperfect measures for instituting fairness in civil life did not carry over into an effective war on poverty. The great society spent most of its surplus on weaponry with a small percentage allocated to nagging our rivals about their bad human rights record. The standoff or zero sum situation, either legal rights or social entitlements was left exactly as it was because that was convenient for everybody. Everybody, that is, who is concerned with high-level interstate politics. Those who are not so favored, namely hungry, poor, sick, or otherwise suffering people, probably had extremely cynical things to say about human rights discourse. But few people with entree to great universities and access to world leaders thought about asking them. The great human rights standoff was a collusion between antagonistic blocs a collusion that told people that there were limits to what they could want or expect. Except that such standoffs can be broken when the will to see past them is there. Enter one hard-headed, warm-hearted, methodologically minded, anthropologically trained MD with a specialty in infectious disease. Paul, as you may know, is modest, except when he's letting his picture be taken on a jitney van named My Intelligence. I'm afraid you can't quite see the motto on that picture, too bad. And he's serious, except when joking around with the respectable matrons of his village in Haiti. 
He began working in Haiti and dragged friends of his to get acquainted with that astonishing nation back in the early 1980s, just as Haitians were beginning to see people die of a strange new disease, what would soon be named AIDS. It hit the countryside hard, which might seem inexplicable until you understand, as only someone with Paul's ethnographic sensibility could, that in Haiti, the disease was spreading along channels of contact between people of unequal station and unequal life chances. Tourists from abroad pairing up with local men, employers pairing up with their servants, blood plasma donors pairing up with dirty needles, soldiers and truck drivers pairing up with women in the villages they passed through. The epidemic furnished an x-ray of Haitian society, showing who was protected and who was most vulnerable. When effective therapies became available, turning HIV from a death sentence into a manageable chronic disease, Paul and his co-conspirators at Partners in Health, Ophelia Dahl and Jim Kim, decided they were going to reverse some of the inequality they saw around them and offer free testing and treatment in their mountain clinic. That act of folly begat others, and I am sure that in the world of development assistance and international public health, many imprecations were pronounced, blaming partners in health for upsetting the established priorities and triage rules. They had taken a specialist issue and made it into a matter of worldwide concern through the category of human dignity. They were doing what public intellectuals do. For from then on, conditions that were thought to be hopeless in poor countries were amenable to treatment and every patient cured was a living rebuke to the former habit of writing them off. Needless to say, the patients had only one complaint, that Partners in Health wasn't doing more and faster and over a greater area. With their donors and partners across the world, they are making the effort again and again. This is what happens when you feed the public intellectual that lurks within many a mild-mannered clinician or social scientist or even physicist or humanist. Sir Amartya Sen has observed that when people lack the means of survival, they are unable to pursue such long-range goals as, as turning the page of their manuscript, as fashioning an equitable political order or balancing freedom of speech against the social good. When, on the other hand, hunger and disease are kept at bay, they can do more for themselves. And living as we do, in an era of great wealth and astonishing scientific discovery, this latter, connecting social and economic rights with civil and legal rights, can, should, must be maneuvered into place. The responsibility is all of ours, at least theoretically, but someone with the will to show what can be done is needed to drive the lesson home. One such person will be here before you tonight, Paul Farmer. Although I've known him since we were both 19, I have told you only a few things about him, and he will doubtless reveal more secrets in his talk which is entitled Health and Human Rights, Lessons from Haiti and Rwanda. Please welcome Paul Farmer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Han. Um, I, I was just reflecting um, with a, a former student of mine who's on the faculty here, Evan Lyon, a physician also. Um, uh, about Han, as we often do. You know that, that beer commercial, I'm sure you all, I'm sure they show this routinely on University of Chicago television, this, the most interesting, what is it, the most interesting man in the world? Well, I was lucky if, you know, uh, enough to meet when we were 18, not 19. It's nice to be able to correct the smartest man in the world. Um, and... Uh, it's just a real uh, privilege to, to be here in large part to uh, visit my lifelong uh, friend and colleague, uh, Han Saucy. I, I'm, you know, I, those of you who are students and faculties and, and members of this community really uh, should be so fortunate to spend uh, time with him. Many of the views that I'm going to lay out uh, here today um, have been informed by, again, a lifelong a friendship uh, with Han, who's helped me to think through some very uh, difficult issues. And uh, those began for me uh, or in college, as, as is the case, I'm sure, for many of you here. Um, but they could begin earlier, um, struggling with notions like 
health and human rights, the notion of, uh, of, of human rights is whether um, you're a phys physicist or, a, or a, a scholar of Chinese poetry or um, any professional field of inquiry is an important thing to do. But if you're a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or a community activist or some combination of, of all of the above, it's really our job uh, to struggle with the notion of human rights. Now, this is not an insight um, that's new. Um, Han mentioned some of the history, of the difficult history of uh, human rights discourses in the previous century. But I'm going to start um, with referring to that discourse as regards um, health care. Uh, and uh, there's a distinction between health and health care, and I'll return to it. Uh, but also then go back to some of our own experience. And um, I say my, my experience, but it's really our experience. I work with thousands of people, some of them here tonight from Partners in Health, and many tens of thousands of supporters of this work. So this experience I'm talking about is, is for us, began 30 years ago um, in Haiti, um, and then with the founding of Partners in Health, and has spread, uh, as Han said, uh, too slowly um, across the world. We, we'd like to see it spread uh, more quickly. Now let me just start with the general and then go back to some specifics. Martin Luther King uh, hit on something very important, uh, I think, uh, when he and others said that disparities of all sorts uh, rankle, trouble us, um, and not enough, it would seem, to see, to follow uh, current trends on economic uh, disparities in this country and across the world. But I think he, he underlines the importance of reflecting on health and health care. Um, any of us can imagine what it might be uh, like to be ill or, and more, more often to the point with uh, young people, including many young people here today at a university, can have had family members or lost family members and can imagine what it would be like to lose those family members without any kind of meaningful, effective medical care. This is a, certainly the great drama. I mean, I have some of my colleagues from, who train with me in medicine are, are here tonight on the faculty. This has been the great drama of our lives uh, as physicians and nurses. Sometimes acknowledge, more often not. Um, and let me just go into this uh, experience in Haiti, but I will, of course, be trying to turn our attention back closer to, uh, to Chicago and other places. Tonight, I'm not going to talk about what I spoke about the last time I was here um, uh, in Chicago, uh, speaking to a, a medical audience or a broad general audience, which is the platform of care that um, we've tried to put in place as partners in health working with, again, in partnership, hence the name. Those partners have always included, or um, certainly in the last 15 years, public health authorities, um, really 20 years. That is, those charged with the health and well-being and often unable to deliver uh, on any kind of social protection, sometimes um, through, as is often noted, corruption, but much more commonly just because there aren't anywhere near uh, adequate resources to deliver on this social compact. And, uh, and this changes over time, and I'll go into some of the changes I've seen in, 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 uh, in three years, but it, it stands um, true in almost all of the places I've worked. Again, these systems are often underfunded, uh, and sometimes they become underfunded as occurred after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I just uh, came here from Haiti, but last month was in Siberia, where Partners in Health has long worked, in part because we saw the collapse of a safety net. And this is not to say that the safety net was particularly good, right? You can, there are lots of studies of the quality of care uh, in, uh, in Russia and across the former uh, Soviet Union. Um, but a safety net, versus no safety net is something that is uh, easy to discern. Uh, and again, it is both local and translocal, right? Um, I'm going to make the argument that global health, what we've been calling global health, is not the same as what I saw 
And what Han saw when he came to visit, which was a, a term that was often called international health, right? In fact, I remember in my first year in medical school was 1984, and uh, of the 165 or so medical students in my class, one or two were really interested in what was often called back then international health. Um, that's it. Now it's pretty much half the class, but we don't use terms like international health so much anymore. We even had terms like overseas, and, you know, which would lead a critically minded person to say, well, which C we, you know, are we talking about? Um, these are not really um, the terms of the movement I'm talking about, which is around equity. And global health equity is the term we use for a reason. And that's Ch Chicago is on the globe as well. The south side of Chicago is on the globe. Uh, this is not as during the Cold War, first world, second world, third world, but one world. And most of the advances that Partners in Health has been involved in, and many other groups much larger than Partners in Health, have been directly and causally related to an acknowledgement that we don't live in three worlds, but one. And uh, this platform is sometimes built in places where uh, there are hospitals but no community health workers, right? And sometimes there are no hospitals, poor quality clinics, and no community health workers. Um, and sometimes you'll see, you go to places in, the, in this one world where there are community health workers and clinics, but no hospitals. In the uh, last 30 years, I've worked in all of those sorts of settings, right? In Russia, for example, there were, there were hospitals, but it was, almost, it was very difficult, as in the United States, to push forward an agenda um, that includes training, credentialing, and paying community health workers. In others, like rural Haiti, as, as Han just mentioned, um, no hospitals, no clinics that were functioning, and no health workers. What do you do then? So this is not the subject of my talk tonight, um, that there is a technical aspect of this work, um, and that this model would be great um, for the United States, just as it would be uh, for rural Rwanda. And I'll return to these lessons I said are going to be from rural Rwanda. And that, you know, one of my uh, friends from Harvard now defected to Chicago, Dave Meltzer, who's here tonight. Um, you know, if you ask experts on health policy um, in the United States, I have uh, more experience actually in hating Rwanda than the United States, although I trained here. We desperately need community-based care, especially for chronic illness. And uh, we have a long way to go. I'll be glad to talk about that uh, with anybody who would, who would like to. But I want to focus a little bit on specific problems that I have seen in Haiti and Rwanda and what we can expect when we don't have all the components of that system of care. I'll talk a little bit about acute illness and a little bit about chronic illness. And it's not going to surprise people here that I'm going to talk about trauma care. Um, I kind of have, I'm kind of guessing that you knew I was going to do that. Um, when, you're, when you open the door um, to people living in poverty or marginalized by other so social forces, that is, that people who don't have robust safety nets to protect them, and this is a human rights talk that we're talking about, they don't enjoy the right to health care then you, are, you open that door, um, you're going to see patients who are critically ill. Um, economists from around the world looking at the number one cause, what pushes families from poverty into destitution, the number one cause in almost every country studied is catastrophic illness. That's true in the United States as well. And the number one cause of death in many places of the world, including the one I just came from this weekend, Haiti, among young people, is trauma. Um, it's motor vehicle accidents in some places, gunshot wounds in, in, in others, but this is, there's an enormous amount of confusion about this uh, in the world today. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, uh, you know, you have cancer in poor countries? Yes, poor people actually also get the same ailments that anybody else gets, and that includes cancer, trauma, major mental illnesses. So these, this is what we see when we're sitting in, a, in rural Africa, just as we would in 
the south side of Chicago. Now you also see on top of that burden of non-communicable illness, although some sociologists would argue that these are in fact in a sense communicable illnesses, violence among them, but we also see other illnesses like malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS, and I'll also talk a little bit about those as well. But anybody who has had this experience, and many young Americans, by the way, have had this experience. They may have had it close to their homes in an American city, or maybe they went someplace like Haiti, or Rwanda, or Malawi, or Lesotho. Lesotho. Again, you open the doors to people's um, frailties and lack of protection, and you see trauma, and you see, again, people sick um, with every imaginable ailment. Now, this boy, for example, I, I just, I, I really on the way over here was looking for um, this uh, picture, came with one of my colleagues from Partners in Health, and uh, was, said, well, I know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take a picture of a child, um, a trauma patient. And she said, well, which talk, I've got some of your talks on my computer, I said, any talk about surgery, right, and took about two minutes, and I remember this boy very well. It's not an unusual kind of uh, uh, example, alas. So this is a boy who, like many children in some parts of the world, wasn't in school, but was doing agricultural work. And I can't, I'm, um, I'm not sure if he even knew his exact age, but let me just say maybe uh, 12, 13 years old, and caught his arm in a mill that was being used to uh, grind uh, sugarcane. Now, by the time he presented, to use the medical jargon, to the very modest clinic that we had built before this uh, medical center that I'll talk about in closing, as you, I don't think you need to be a physician to guess what this is, or a nurse. You know, this is gangrene, and you didn't even have to look. You just have to be in proximity. You can smell gangrene. And uh, so, it's bad enough that he had this injury, right? That's, if he had been in school, like we would like every 12 or 13 year old to be, then he wouldn't have had the <clears throat> injury perhaps, that's primary prevention, right? And that's why many of us work on poverty reduction in that sense. If he hadn't been far away from proper care and had the wound tended to, then he would not have gotten gangrene, right? But what really, uh, rankles, uh, I used that word twice, and Han's probably going to say, why did you say rankled twice? <laughs> or maybe his wife will say that. She's usually my biggest critic. <laughs> um, what really bothers me, and sometimes actually I in, I'm introducing humor because these are such painful uh, subjects, and it's going to kind of get worse. Um, what really rankles is that the most common outcome of this is not amputation, but death. Because that third chance to save his life is when you can do an amputation. Now, in this particular boy's case, um, he got in there in time, had an amputation uh, that same day, and you know healed up fine. He had an above the elbow amputation, so um, he's got one arm. But in each of these, along these trajectories, you see a chance for preventing some horrible outcome. And, uh, and this is, again, the great drama in my experience of being a physician or a nurse or a social worker, anyone who, again, is in proximity to these sometimes outrageous risks that people living in poverty face. Now, you've heard the term uh, recently, I'm sure, about trauma deserts. Um, you've heard about food deserts. Maybe you haven't. I'll, I'll just. Um, you know, define it uh, very um, briefly. And of course, the dramatic example is uh, what we saw in 2010. But uh, uh, one of the, term, one of the first time I heard this term um, some years ago was really about when some of my colleagues were working on obesity in uh, the southeastern United States um, and in, in, in Boston. And you know, there's, there's a great deal of discussion, why, are, why, why is there an epidemic obes of obesity? Is it that, you know, people lack some sort of self-control? 
That's a, by the way, the common default explanation for every bad thing that happens to poor people is that it's their fault, right? So cognitivist explanations of poor outcomes are, are the rule unless they're fought. And it wasn't until later when people started looking at some of the structural determinants, what goes into food, you know, and food processing, but also the relative in, um, the difficulty people have in getting fresh, wholesome food, uh, depending on where they live. And, uh, and that's the first time I heard this term uh, used in, in reference to a health um, challenge. Now, trauma deserts are what made this boy lose his arm, right? And uh, again, any, uh, so many of you have been to Haiti, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, return to the question of Mirabale Hospital because it was really our community of concern here in Chicago that was the primary champion of this modern hospital. So many of you, if not most of you, have probably donated to this cause. But the trauma desert in Haiti is among the most extreme that I've seen. There's not any access to trauma care. And this usually, by the way, comes into relief when there is a natural disaster or when an American um, in Haiti or um, has need for a you know, surgical procedure or blood transfusion after an accident or an injury of some sort. It comes into, that's when it's seen. It's a chronic problem, not just in Haiti, but across the poor world. There is not safe surgical care, anesthesia, um, and not care for complex ailments like burns. Just to go back to uh, Mirabale, I, I was there the, um, uh, this weekend, as I said, but also the weekend before. It's so close, you know. And there are some people who would argue that Chicago was actually founded by a Haitian, as many of you know. It's right around the corner. I saw a girl there, and I, I went into pediatrics to see another patient, a patient I'd been following for some time, an infectious disease patient. And <clears throat> this girl who um, was just screaming, um, you know, she was just saying two words, Mom, Jesus, Mom, Jesus, again, is screaming. And I, you know, I, I, I thought, that's the girl who is burned. And 60% um, uh, burn over her body. And uh, in fact, the last time I, I spoke here, I was with a colleague who's an uh, eminent burn specialist here in Chicago. And I have to say, and I'm, I'm, I, I was saying to my friends who came with me, I think I'm going to use a lot of first person tonight. I don't much care for that kind of talking, but um, you know, maybe this is a better way of reflecting on these challenges that can be, seem so abstract, health, human rights. you know. How do we make those vivid? So to me, that girl screaming um, in pain, this is a human rights issue. Again, not only was she burned, and then I later found out when I, t uh, after she had some pain meds, not only was she burned and almost died many times since it transpires February 21st, but she has no access to pain control. And, you know, so what is that? Is, you know, what is that if not a fundamental human rights issue? All the way along, again, prevention, uh, uh, um, full body burn, why? Because her clothes caught on, caught on fire when she was lighting something, you know, trying to light a cooking fire. It happens all the time. Um, then, turns out she was from southern Haiti. You just look at a map and see where Mirabale is. It's in central north Haiti. Somehow she had to, and I found out how by talking to her mother, get all the way from southern Haiti through Port-au-Prince, you know, the, the major city in Haiti, all the way to central Haiti to University Hospital. By the way, we didn't make it, we didn't call it University Hospital just so I could make a point here tonight about trauma. I was supposed to kind of, I thought, an insider joke. When we, when we talk to the authorities about calling this university hospital, um, one of, some of the biggest critics said of the idea of having a university hospital in rural central Haiti, said, well, there's no university there. How can you? And I said, not a university there yet. There will be. Right. Anyway, so I just couldn't stand it, you know, which is hardly the point, right? Oh, well, really, my 
health and well-being is the real main issue in a pediatrics ward in rural Haiti. I'm kidding. So I called the resident. I called the trainee. I called the nurse and said, call the resident. It, which is not a really nice thing to do. After all, you know, I had founded the organization. and They get nervous sometimes, the young doctors, when I walk in to see a patient. And uh, I spent a lot of time trying to make that not happen. But I, I just couldn't bear it. And of course, she's in pain whether I see it or not, right? Unless she has pain control. And what kind of protection is going to give her pain control? Only a rights-based argument. You know, what are you going to do? Argue that it's not cost-effective for her to be in horrible pain? Um, and we're willing to do that too, by the way. In any case, so sh she got some... Uh, she got a narcotic, and you, I would challenge everybody to look at how morphine and other inexpensive um, palliatives like that are dis distributed in the world. Basically, no poor people have access to pain control, period. You know, I'm just saying that in an emphatic way, to, but if you just follow the, the, you know, how many milligrams of morphine or any other you know, opiate, go to poor countries, forget about saying poor people in poor countries, because I'm saying they're just not on the, anybody who was in Haiti after the earthquake knows this. And then compare to Canada, say, as, a, as we're trying to do with a bunch of, an exercise, just a mapping exercise. So then she stopped uh, screaming those two words, and I went to see my patient, and then I came back and asked her mother. She was smiling. The kid was smiling. Her name is Shirley, by the way. I asked her. She told me herself. She gave me a kiss. The next time, I got to give morphine more often. <clears throat> Get more. Anyway, I asked her mother what you know what happened when she was. I'd seen her many times, but she you know hadn't. I hadn't been. Cons I'm an infectious disease consultant. Hadn't been asked to see her. And the story was this. She 21st of February. She got burned. She went to one hospital. They told her flat out. You know. You really can't get your care here because you can't pay. Now, there was an intervention by one of our former trainees, a Haitian physician who's now um, a, a surgeon. And she intervened and got this kid up there. But I'm basically, burn care in Haiti, again, just like trauma care, almost none of it. So. Then, you know, um, you start finding out just by asking, you know, how did this come to uh, be and what, what is, you know, what did you do first? I, I have an obsession with this, but I'm telling you, this is, these are the biggest problems or the most complex problems that we see in these clinics and hospitals. Now, a lot of people know, and Han mentioned this about, um, AIDS, and I'm just going to give you an example of uh, the, the activism around AIDS. It's pretty unprecedented, uh, I think, in modern medical history, and there are lots of reasons why that. So first of all, when does met modern medical history start? Probably not before the mid-20th century. I would say it doesn't. You had uh, surgical care, but not much in the way. You didn't have antibiotics, really, to mid-century. So, Really, this all began recently, and that's why Lewis Thomas talks about medicine as the youngest science, right? So global health equity, when people say, oh, this is nothing new with this, don't believe it. It's completely new because we didn't really have um, a lot of com care for complex illness that was worth fighting to disseminate. And this is just another, I actually saw this patient on Sunday, um, but not to, because he's a, he needed my care because he's a friend of mine. This is 15 years ago, classic, first slide, classic presentation um, of AIDS and tuberculosis. And again, just imagine, again, you open the door to a clinic, what happens? And, and let's apply a non-human rights framework. And there are several. Um, some of the frameworks are around economic value. Um, there are many more. I mentioned some of the explanatory frameworks, cognitivist, behavioral, and behaviorist explanations, which really don't do much to illuminate why some people are so sick and others less so. At least I don't believe they do. Um, and uh, some of the other frameworks are also very helpful. Like if you're going to talk to maybe a head of state, minister of finance, you might say, you know, 
Investing in health care delivery is really going to be good for the economy. I do that all the time. That's a very, it's a development argument. Then there are other public goods arguments. Public, it's, it's a, if AIDS and tuberculosis are the leading infectious killers of young adults, then surely some strategy for investing in the only care that we have is a good public health intervention. We do that too. But in the end, I would argue that it was really the rights framework um, that moved this agenda forward. And in a, this is why I'm grateful to those of you who are supporting this work here. Now, let me just give an example. I, I took the names off of, I, I removed the names from the people who said this because often these are friends of mine, peers, you know, right? Um, and I'm not trying to make an attack on individuals. I'm saying the logic that has dominated post-mid 20th century medical and public health has not been a rights framework. It's been almost absent. Now, not absent from families and from, um, you know, in, in uh, non-professionalized discourse, but really <clears throat> compared to the 19th century when we didn't have these tools, rights language has, had really fallen away by the, you know, and again, some people will study this discourse. So this kind of argument is just really classic throughout my medical training. I told you I started medical school in 1984, and this is the diet that anyone who was interested in public health was fed for decades, right? Uh, that something is going to be assessed on whether it's cost effective. Now, that's actually another good tool, right? Cost effectiveness. But the next part of critical thinking might be to say, okay, well, is it easy to do a, a determined cost? It's just that basic question. It's, it's just stunning how people confuse, we do anyway in medicine, price with cost. And while we're at it, how easy is it to determine effectiveness? That's no trivial matter either. So to argue that the only treatment that we had at that time, and still to this day for AIDS, which is called combination is ART, antiretroviral therapy, it doesn't matter what it's called, right? That's the only treatment we had when these statements were made, and it's still the only treatment we have. So it's really important to get that right. And the same about goes for trauma care. There's got to be some cost, right, if you have or in a place where there's a lot of trauma, or major mental illness, but no equity plan to reach people most in need. Now, this is what could have, this, and I, I, could, I gave some examples. Um, this is both from the same news magazine in one year. Um, the end of AIDS, again, this is 1996. A very exciting moment, by the way, for I was, in 1996, I was what's called an infectious disease fellow. So I'd finished my training with David Meltzer, among others, at the Brigham. Uh, big Harvard Teaching Hospital where Evan Lyon also trained and went on to specialize in infectious disease and I remember the year 1994-95 because Harvard uh, hospitals were involved in teaching I mean in clinical trials the one of the biggest problems we saw causes of death in America's urban hospitals was AIDS so people would come in and they'd die in the hospital that was th throughout my medical training as a med student and an intern. And then suddenly, they got up and walked out and went home, right? And it's just, and still, we, there are lots of people who die of HIV um, across the world, but mortality rates in, in the United States plummeted in the mid-90s because of this combination chemotherapy. Now, the same magazine, a year later, says it best, right? Some people were already being called too poor to treat, right? And this was a, you know, this, they weren't saying this, they were reporting, these two journalists, reporting what even doctors and nurses were saying, well, people aren't gonna take their medicines, you know? And this was, again, the steady diet we faced if you're moving between Harvard and Haiti in those years, or Harvard and Rwanda, or Harvard and South Africa. It's not cost effective, people aren't gonna take the treatment. Again, these are purely speculative. How do they, you know, how does anybody know? You know, we didn't, we didn't try and fail back in 1997 to roll out, as they say, this therapy for people living in poverty, right? It just didn't happen. 
it would, so this is what was happening um, back just 13, 14 years ago, um, is basically AIDS mortality in, here I think it says the Western world, like again, it's sort of like saying overseas, you know, is West, what, is that Utah? You know, so meaning the affluent world, the rich world, you know, with all its internal inequalities, and basically, you know, Africa, which was uh, poor and heavily burdened, again, not, not the subject of my talk, because that would get me off on another hour-long digression of how those go together. But this didn't happen, right? ART means antiretroviral therapy. This is not what happened, and why not? Because you need staff and stuff. First, you need to figure out who do you need to help treat people with AIDS. Do you need a trauma center to do that? No. Do you need an infectious disease doctor? Uh-uh. It'd be, I hope we're handy to have around, but it's, we're not required, right, for this. It's not like uh, trauma care where you need a surgical team with anesthesia in it, right? This is community health workers, staff, um, and the stuff was the medications, and why did we have the funding? Because the United States, um, and again, I would say, unapologetically, I, I, from unexpected quarters, support for the largest global health equity program in human history. And I'm still grateful for it, right? As, as are the 10 million people who have publicly funded free care for AIDS in the world today. Because most of them would be dead now if they weren't getting it. In other words, the economic models of having the patient pay for the care failed, and instead of just saying, eh, you know, they're too poor to treat, something actually got done. So the financing of this care for an incurable illness, right, is very, instead of just saying it's going to defeat us, we put money into it. Now, let me just, um, and this is a very interest, important chat for any, I think anybody, anybody ought to know about this, the, the role of AIDS activists in this turnaround is important. And the role of governments and, and some foundations, and I'm, I'm proud that the U.S. government is the big player, and not just in its bilateral programs, PEPFAR, it's called President's Emergency Plan for AIDS, but also in funding the multilateral. I mean, the jargon is kind of irritating, but that just means the global fund and other mechanisms that go through um, something other than the United States government. U.S. government, your tax dollars are invested in both those cases. Now, I'm just going to say this, make this claim very, very uh, quickly, that this is fundamentally a rights-based model, right? Because you can say, even when people aren't saying, well, people ought to have the right to not die of AIDS, um, that's different from saying it's not sustainable or cost-effective, which was, as I said, the steady diet um, of public health for many uh, decades, not so much in the 19th century, but definitely in the latter half of the 20th century. So the logic of rights that people ought not to be subjected to that risk was easily the most powerful part of the arguments that swayed decision makers, right? And there are many others, there are complexities that are important to talk about, but the AIDS activists who helped push this onto the world stage were unabashedly using rights-based arguments. We have the right to not die, and so should they, right? That solidarity, which doesn't always count, come out of, you know, identity politics, and I'm going to mention this because I want to talk about a, 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 a little trauma problem of, of my own. Just look at the impact of this. And again, we, uh, we, uh, if you were to cast what's happened in Rwanda over the last 15 years in rights terms, which we often have, is the extension of modern medical care, including treatment for AIDS, but not only, has led to the steepest declines in mortality ever registered any place at any time. Rwanda, the basket case of 20 years ago, which lay in ruins after the most explosive and devastating episode of mass violence and rights violations in the history of that continent, is now the world leader in the reversal of mortality due to AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, maternal mortality way up there, vaccine-preventable illness. 
Now, what this doesn't solve is Rwanda's trauma problem. And I just want to say, this is the, and I'll, I'll, I'll close shortly. Many of you, I, I, I hate even looking at this graph, right? Um, and it's recently made because it means something very different to some of us in the room, me, Evan, others who were in Haiti uh, at, at the time. This is the same positive trend, declining mortality among children, both those affected by HIV and those uh, not living with HIV, not as steep as Rwanda's, but again, this is putting money into the system. So don't when people say, ah, oh, never works, stuff never works in, you know, in Haiti or Rwanda. It's not true. But what turned that around was the absence of trauma care and an awful and, uh, alas, predictable, predictable but unpredicted <clears throat> disaster. Now this is, this is the uh, nursing school, and I'm sure Evan also does not like reflecting on these days or looking at the picture, but I will say that after the earthquake, we at Partners South had a very serious um, set of problems. In addition to having lost friends and coworkers and being there, we also had to figure out what are we going to do now, right? The infrastructure, including the trauma infrastructure, was revealed to be ineffective, and such as it was, it was destroyed. So is the teaching infrastructure, and those are often the same things. This is the dilemma that we're facing in Chicago right now, right? What is the role of a university and a teaching hospital in taking on trauma? So we decided that we would actually, and again, with the help of people in this city, that we would build a major teaching center in rural Haiti. And I can tell you and, um, that a lot of people scoffed at this just as, again, not, not patients. They're, I didn't hear much scoffing from them, right? But the experts, our peers, said that it's not an appropriate use of resources after a natural disaster. Which I could buy the argument if there had been other teaching hospitals with trauma capacity and surgical capacity in the country. But there were not. So we said, and we're going to make it big and we're going to make it solar powered, right? We're going to have a, we're going to build a, this actually was designed in part by colleagues from Chicago. I don't know if they're here, volunteers, I might add. And this is in central Haiti, that same town that Han showed the embarrassing pictures of me 30 some odd years ago. And again, the, this next picture, you saw Han's picture, but I, this is where I was seeing patients last weekend. This is not another charrette. This is a completed hospital. It's probably the largest solar powered hospital in the developing world today. And what is the biggest problem that we see? Trauma. Can't, you know, we see, I say biggest problem. This is why we have to have a proper trauma center and why trauma deserts are always going to be associated with poor outcomes, especially when you take on that low-hanging fruit. You know, it's not like AIDS is low-hanging fruit, but there are many things that are much more difficult to prevent, palliate, treat, or cure um, and, well, AIDS is not possible to cure, but you know, you, you know what I mean. You, you see these problems when you work in a place like this. So let me just um, close with one word. And I, 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 I was, I, like I said, I really don't, I don't like talking about uh, personal experience that much because it doesn't seem like a very authentic way to engage the drama of, of other people's illness. It doesn't seem that way to me. Because, you know, it's not like I don't have insurance. But I had an experience. You know how your, your mom says, look both ways before you cross the street? Well, let me advise that you follow your mother's counsel on that score. And uh, as a Harvard medical student in, uh, in my fourth year of medical school, um, another college chum of ours, I was, you know, excitedly showing my proofs of my first paper. Talk about the quest for personal efficacy. You guys all have a bad here in Chicago, though, so you should at least recognize that. Thank you, by the way. So I, the last words out of my mouth were, Todd, you're not paying attention to me. Well, I wasn't paying attention to traffic on the corner of Fresh Pond Parkway and here on Ave and walked right in front of a car. Now, the first thing that struck me as after the car struck me was that there was a bus headed my way and it swerved the second 
coup de, the coup de grace. So I was already feeling rather cheerful lying there with a broken leg. All the uh, bones in my leg were broken. And the guy came over to me who, you know, who was driving the car. And my friend who you know, was really helpful, he passed out. <laughs> it's like, I'm the one who got hit by the damn car, not you. So I'm lying there, and, uh, and the guy who hit me came over, and I said, I am so sorry. He said, is he right in the head? And Todd said, oh, he's always like that. It was my fault, you know. That is my fault. But I'm saying, I have a safety net. I have a, a chance not to be maimed or to die from an accident like that. The next thing that happened was, you know, this is in the middle of this very busy intersection. I had been headed back to Haiti the, the next day. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I'm not thinking it looks too good for me not to get back to Haiti tomorrow because my leg is kind of going at unnatural Julia Child chicken preparation <laughs> angles. And, um, and these guys came over from the ambulances, and, uh, and there, were, there was more than one, said, uh, so um, we're going to take you to Sancta Maria Hospital. Now, no offense to Sancta Maria Hospital, but I never heard of it, and I was a fourth-year Harvard med student. So I actually stuck up for myself and said, no, you're not going to take me to said hospital. Take me to Mount Auburn Hospital, which is right around the corner. And then the chief of orthopedics looked at these films in the emergency room, whereupon, by the way, my friend then proceeded to faint again. And then his girlfriend, now his wife, came in, and she was of no use either. Um, he said, you know, you really, you ought, we're going to transfer you to the Mass General. And, uh, and I thought, wow, I mean, that's got to be bad to go from one Harvard teaching hospital to another. And, uh, and off I went. And I couldn't walk unassisted without, a, you know, crutches or a wheelchair for half a year. And it threw off my medical school training and all that. Now, why am I telling you that story? Because I think you'll remember, you know, and I don't, I've written about surgical care and trauma in the developing world for years. And people, it's hard for us to get our handle, our arms around, you know, the need that we all have for social protection as a right. And one of the ways we're going to do that, I believe, is to embrace this rights language, in addition to the many other ways of analyzing, again, the cost of catastrophic illness or the cost of inactivity. And uh, I would just like to say thank you and thank those who sponsored my visit here. Um, thank you for hearing me out on these complexities and why uh, this rights-based framework can be so powerful, especially if we stop and think as it took me many years to do, reflecting on my own, you know, misfortune, which I dismissed as banal. I had insurance. I had pain care. I had a surgeon, a bunch of them. You know, I had an anesthesiologist. I had a wheelchair. But most people, or many people, don't always have those things. And, and uh, you know, I hope we, you will find this a useful framework, even for considering problems right here in this great city of broad shoulders. Thank you very much. All right, we're open for questions from the audience. How in your mind, and I may become unpopular among the economists in here, uh, or who may be here, but how in your mind do you transition away and shift a discourse towards a rights-based, and for want of a better word, qualitative analysis of human rights and away from the quantitative analysis that has become so important for so many people in society today? Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, some of my best friends are economists, um, including doctor economists. And you know, I think what I would say is it's not a question of moving away from quantitative uh, analyses. In fact, my critique there was really a quantitative critique, right? That in fact, cost is not that easy to assess quantitatively either, right? It gets conflated with price, et cetera, nor is effectiveness. So. The, the rights-based framework, I would say, should be 
tacked on to these other complementary modes of understanding. And in a way, it's the backup. It's, it's the safety net paradigm, right? The rights based paradigm. Because, you know, just take this hospital in Haiti. Um, we still don't have the financing plan, right? And that is, that was, that's, we worked on it this morning. Actually, the, you know, the, the Prime Minister of Haiti came to Harvard Medical School this morning along with the Minister of Health. What were we doing? You know, uh, early this morning, we we're talking about how are we going to finance this. So it's not so much quantitative versus qualitative. We need better quantitative analyses. Every health economist worth his or her salt is always saying that, and they're right. And they can be informed by qualitative analyses, but this paradigm of saying, look, we might not have this worked out. We're sorry we have to use words like human dignity or respect, but we know there's something there. And, uh, you know, I think we should just embrace that as, regardless of what our own disciplinary, you know, in, engagement might be. Amartya Sen is a very good example, I think, um, uh, and uh, Han just referred to him as someone who isn't saying we, we need to move away from quantitative analysis, saying, look, there are things that we, you know, the value of justice and equity is, is, um, is hard to assess, but we ought to give it a try. So I hope you're going to stick with this if you're interested in, in, uh, in this arena of, of yeah, inquiry. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm a grad student here, and I'm also a part of the uh, Trauma Center campaign. Um, so you obviously sort of, I mean, you addressed the, the issue of, of trauma care, I think, very well in this talk. And I think you sort of hinted a lot at, at the issue that's faced on the south side of Chicago. But I was just wondering if, if I could sort of get a, like, what you think, like, do, do you think the University of Chicago Medical Center should open a level one adult trauma center? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I'm not shy, I'm not shy to venture my opinion, right? Sure, yeah, no. And I, I will, I mean, if you are in a place, remember I used the term burden and gap, and I would, in, in, you know, I, I hope you'll find that useful too. If you're in a place uh, where one of the biggest causes of death is trauma, and I, that was true in Rwanda, Haiti, Malawi, it's also true, alas, in Chicago. And it is, it, you know, there's a lot, a lot of it's related to gunshot wounds and other kinds of trauma. If you're in a place like that, and you are, you're sitting in one, or standing in your case, young graduate <laughs> student, um, <laughs> And you can show that their disparities of access lead to increased mortality, which you can, and, and it has been done. And then you say, and in the middle of this place, we've got as the jewel in the crown of this part of the city, the great University of Chicago. Of course, I think that the university should be involved in addressing these problems. And I also think, And I also think that universities should play that role, right? And they're ambivalent. They, they're, I mean, all the major research universities of the United States have this deep ambivalence about service to communities. They'll say, well, no, we're in research and teaching. Now, where is the one part of the university where it's actually forbidden to have that restrained way of thinking? It's in the academic medical center, right? That's for 100 years since the Flexner Report. The union of service delivery, care, and you know, caregiving in, in every sense, you know, with training and research. It's been 100 years we made that pact, right? That we're not going to award a medical degree without learning how to do clinical care. You know, before 1910, you get a Harvard medical degree without ever working in a hospital. And I'm barely exaggerating. So, you know, the answer is, of course, and it, it's a, it's a, I think a, it's, it's a blot on the American university to be so damn ambivalent about service to community. Thank you. Don't forget I define community very globally. <laughs> okay. So so my name is Adil Menon. I'm a second year in the university, an aspiring uh, physician. Uh, 
in another interview, I believe it was the 200th anniversary video for the New England Journal of Medicine, you had cited how the real change in HIV care in Haiti was when you were, got access to generics more readily. Yeah. So how is it that clearly that was because the more major pharmaceutical companies wouldn't see it as an investment. So how do you convince these organizations who understand the value of a dollar but not always the value of treatment or helping in these situations to take those steps and do that? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's sort of a philosophical response and a technical response, right? And, and I'm sorry to be unable to not say a little bit about both of them. Um, the technical response first. Um, you said, how do you persuade? And then you mentioned an institution, it's like a, a company. And of course, the companies are, well, actually, the Supreme Court said corporations are people, right? And money is free speech, yes. So basically, they're full of humanoids, right? So the, I can say the way that we were involved and many others to actually go in there and you know, sit down and say, what's our equity plan? Some institutions dropped out, said, well, you know, we're not really going to be able to help you. Some stayed in, and including some surprising ones, as I said. And some said, well, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to, bring down the cost of the drugs, right? And that was a, a technical discussion with manufacturers. So you're calling them the generic manufacturers, and they are, right? But it's interesting that a lot of the predictions made, for example, I remember one in 2002, this is from my friends and colleagues, the United States is never going to support using generic treatment, ART, for with, you know, what would be called, later be called PEPFAR. And, you know, I say, really? How do you know, right? Well, how do we know? We, we can't say that until we, you know, make the case and then see it fail, right? And, in fact, they did support generic. Almost all of it across the world, those 10 million people, instead of being $15,000 per patient per year, it's about 90, and some places less. Now, again, that strikes me. I'm not an economist, but when you're talking about cost-effective, and you've got to split, you're not, don't go anywhere, I'm still talking to you. <laughs> when you're talking about cost effectiveness, right? I'm just getting warmed up. When you're talking about cost effectiveness and, and you say, well, this is cost effective, this is not, and you've got a split of 15,000 per patient per year versus 90, you've got an analytic problem too, right? If you can't tell the difference, same drug, same molecule. And so those technical parts of this, these discussions in general are really important. Philosophically, you know, that's why I keep going back to these rights-based arguments. Not exclusively, right? It would be a shame if I could not muster a kind of critical assessment of both cost and effective, effectiveness, and I was just using a rights-based argument. And I have to correct sometimes my students when they're saying, well, cost-effectiveness is bad. It's not bad at all. It's great. You just got to be committed to that technical assessment. Philosophical part, you know, don't, I and mean, this is advice to, to you if you may permit me to be avuncular or professorial or whatever. Um, we can't give up on people in those institutions, right? We can't say, you know, they're never going to be on our side. They're never going to get our backs. They're never going to, and uh, because it's just not, it's not true. I just gave a critique of the American Research University, right? You, you pretty emphatic, but every university is being pushed by its students very often to engage more in this notion of service. And, um, and again, the university is a benign example. There, are, there probably are some institutions um, and companies that just like it's a lost cause, but I just assume I'm not gonna bump into them. So the philosophical point, you know, we're not being naive, we just think everybody can be part of global health equity. Thanks. Or social justice. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for walking away a bit early. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Hello, Dr. Farmer. Thank you for your talk. My Thank name you. is Lola Oladini. I'm a first year medical student at Pritzker School of Medicine. My question is about advocacy and how sometimes it seems like there is a fragmentation of efforts. So like, for instance, in the situation of the trauma center, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, having a trauma center, but then it's like, 
in the aspect of prevention, people can't advocate, people aren't advocating for both things at the same time. Yeah. So like you're not talking about education of these high school students before they get to the point where gun, you know, where gun violence becomes prevalent. Like yeah. you're talking about one aspect, right. but like it seems like we're competing. And That's when you right. wanna talk about the education issue, it's like, no, not trauma, education, yeah. whereas it's both. And I guess my question is, how do you form such a partnership where you're not yeah. competing for resources in different facets of advocacy? Yeah. Well, that's a very astute question. And I got to say, I'm glad to hear a first year med student ask that because I think, you know, uh, I know from personal experience when I was a first year medical student, um, which is, you know, as I said, 30 something years ago, that we got tripped up on this all the time. And it's still a major pathology. You know, we have all kinds, I usually call it balkanization, right? It's like everybody who's on the side of something good, how about less misery, less death, less pain, less suffering, right? We're competing with each other, like the, you know, the balkanization. But I was giving a talk at the United Nations one time, and they said, you're not allowed to use the word balkanization here. <laughs> so I, I went back to Harvard, and I told them this story with some relish, them being my colleagues, including my um, uh, former classmate from Harvard Medical School, uh, a psychiatrist named Ann Becker, and I worked with her and I told her the story. I said, so I said, okay, siloization. She said, hey, I'm from the Midwest and I resent that <laughs> remark. So the, the serious point of this is you, I would advise you to get really rigorous about before you even have this discussion, meaning about, you mentioned the trauma center, or you could pick a lot of bad you know, outcomes that you want to think about and say, how do we avoid the pitfalls of pitting prevention against care, policy against service, research against training? Because that exercise can be very both illuminating but protect this, us from this ridiculous squabbling over various ways of doing something good. I mean, you didn't even mention gun control, right? And there's, so in addition, another trap, of course, is educating young people in high school without thinking about the policy issue and putting it all on them, right? All on young kids. The, 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 the intervention that will diminish, the interventions rather, excuse me, that will diminish gun violence can't be only among the primary victims of gun violence, even if they're the perpetrators often as well. So go through the exercise, you know, and I, I would, be glad to, I'm sure you've read my best-selling book, Women, Poverty, and AIDS, in which I, <laughs> did, uh, so you're, I'm sure you're the person who bought it in Chicago. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, did, we did really try to struggle with this many times, you know, and if we could share these, again, there are other people who write about those. William Ryan, right, Blaming the Victim, great book in this, from the 60s. You know, we can look back and find, you know, people, help all of us think this through very critically, but just get it out there as part of the activism and engagement. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your sometimes emotional uh, mm. speech tonight. Um, my name is Antonia. I tried to make it not emotional, but it's, you know. For you or for me, I don't oh. know. It was emotional for me as well. No, I mean, I, I, it's a, some of those things are really just difficult to even think about, but I'm not talking about my own injury, which I tried to <laughs> lighten up. Right. Sorry. Thank you. No, no. Bless you. Um, I'm an alum of the college and the School of Social Work here, and now I work at the IMPACT program over at Northwestern. Boo, hiss, yes. Um, and, the, and we work with LGBTQ young people, par primarily around HIV and mental health, and so I wanted to kind of go in my direction for a moment. Um, granted that we can't, at the moment, get ART to as many people around the world who desperately need it, Given that, um, do you feel that some of the movement around PrEP, PEP, treatment as prevention is somewhat hopeful in this direction towards secondary and primary pre yeah. prevention as a, as a broader strategy? Well, first of all, thank you for your work on this. And we, as you uh, know better, I'm sure, than and most of us, we have a, we're not doing a good job in the United States on, now I, and you know, I, I, uh, I'm going to recommend a book um, to you. Uh, I was asked to write a blurb. I get asked to write blurbs a fair amount. And, you know, I say, well, 
How about, how about a preface instead? I mean, I don't always have to say it. I just read a really long blurb because I hate concision. Um, and then they say, hey, we're going to make this into a preface. Anyway, I was asked by Elton John to write a blurb for his book. And I thought, I mean, what am I going to say, right? You can't say, no, Elton John, I will not write a blurb for your book. You know? What would my parents say? <laughs> so I said, of course, right? And um, the name, you know, I almost said the R word again rankled. I didn't really like the name. It was Love is the Cure, and I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go. It was one of the best books I've ever read, right? And I, it, you know, reading about, thinking about Ryan White, about the link between human rights and the epidemic in the United States around racism, gender equality, you know, homophobia. It's, and not ignoring the poorest parts of the world. I mean, it's just a great book. So I, I would encourage you to, to read it. And it's technically a very good book, too, meaning medically, it's, it's a great book. And I did write the preface. And I was only upset that they cut out half of it. Back to the technical question. Calm down, Han. Uh, so it's great when your best friend is your monarch. I just say that I'm very excited about the treatment as prevention part. Because primary prevention is hard, right? Meaning, you know, I'm so, you know, appalled at the way we blame the victim all the time, right? And it's just not even subtle. I say we as a species, not, I don't think in, in, uh, in I, even in the medical community, it's, it's pretty shameful. So s primary prevention is hard. Secondary prevention, um, you know, if you say, look, tuberculosis, poverty is the cause of tuberculosis. We're not going to waste our time treating tuberculosis. We'll attack poverty. Really? We got the... We got the prescription for poverty all worked out? No. We do have the prescri prescription, however, for the treatment of tuberculosis, which is treatment. And that's what makes someone non-infectious. The pain we went through 15 years ago saying, no, no, no don't say, and, and your, the, your colleague who asked the uh, other question about pitting prevention against care, of course, that was the great drama, as you saw in the AIDS debates, the public policy debates. And we said, but wait. Just as with other infectious diseases, treatment is going to be prevention. It took 10 years to get everybody on board. So I'm very excited about these new developments. I think we have to you know, understand how to discuss them as not an alternative to all of the prevention that needs to be done. I mean, if you could say, look, gender inequality and poverty are the two main risk factors for HIV in the world, probably, in the global, the global world. We have to fight gender inequality, homophobia, rights abuses, and poverty. You know, that, but we also have tools to prevent and care for people that are feed right back into the rights movement. And, and we, we have to embrace those. And I mean, I'm not lecturing you or hectoring you. You're doing this, you know. And we all need to get better at understanding the link between these various modalities. It's not going to be just male circumcision versus and then fill in the blank. And this fetishization of one vertical intervention is a pathology in, in our species, as I said. And I think we can fight that and, and you know, embrace complexity and multiple modes of intervention. And that's why we should all be excited about these new findings. Thank you for the work you're doing as well. Not at all. Thank you. Um, we have just a few minutes. I was wondering, maybe we could have a series Questions He's so polite, you know, his southern charm, Nashville. And then I'm coming in as the hammer. Yeah, we do have to wrap this up in five well, maybe, minutes. <laughs> should, I, should I take them all and then just give one, like, masterful? One to, to I'm, rule them all? Yes, one answer, one response to rule them all. <laughs> one response to bind them. The young folk Lawrence, laugh. Um, my name is Zahra. Most people can't pronounce it, so Zahra is fine. Um, I'm just wondering what would you say is the most effective way to combat this globally for, so, for human rights and social inequities? Yeah, combat what? Combat this globally, combat human rights globally or combat health okay. inequities globally. All right, I'll, I'll 
get to that, I promise, most effective. Hi, um, I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to how you approach balancing the need to reach people who are suffering and provide care and interventions now um, and the way that that sometimes forces us into positions where we have to form partnerships with regimes that may not be open to critique, but we strongly disagree with and feel um, should be critiqued, yeah. um, but maybe in providing care or in the, the partnership for providing care, we don't feel that we can engage in that kind of critique. That's a great, great question. I'm glad to struggle with it. Hi, my name is Jenny, um, and along the line of balance, but on a different note, um, what do you feel the role of ethnography is in maintaining and reaffirming a rights-based approach, and how do you strive to maintain it, if you do, um, now looking at this at such a global level? Yeah, ethnography you said, right? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Riva. Um, and also, sorry, but my mother would kill me if I did not tell you that she loves you more than pretty much anything. Um, Including her own daughter. I like this lady. Um, but Thank my you. question is, how do you address the idea of like urgency when you're yeah. treating these and like saying what exactly is a human right? For example, if you're treating mental health in another country, you might say that antidepressants are really necessary for someone, but they're not necessarily as urgent as something like HIV AIDS treatment. How do you address what is a fundamental human right and what is... Yeah. Mm, important, but not necessary. Hi, my name is Odette Zero, and it's a little unrelated, but I was wondering how your background in anthropology has affected how you treat patients as a physician. Yeah. Well, where's Susan? You, now, you, you're going to see if I can really pull this off, Susan? A magisterial response to all those? I think you're capable of it. <laughs> well, I, you know, in a way, okay, in this anti-balkanization mode, they, they are all related questions, right? If you, if you link the, ethno the specifics of the ethnography and anthropology question to ways of effectively um, you know, fighting uh, for human rights, including in circumstances where you might not find yourself in agreement with what you call the regime, right? Um, that was already pretty good, I thought, Susan. <laughs> so let me just go into the, you know, um, don't get scared, I'm not going into anything. On ethnography and anthropology, I'm going to make a, a general epistemological point. I can't resist the E word. Um, as I, the reason I told that story at the end, which as I said, which is the story of walking in front of the car, which is not really, I really don't care to do that myself. You know, it's not, I mean, I don't care to walk in front of cars myself either, but I meant the narrative. And a narrative is not ethnography, but ethnography is like listening to what people say, right, and watching what it is they do. It's the, the vividness of being there, of knowing, and people understand that when you're telling a story. Film does it very well, right? Um, you're, you're there. It has all its little tricks as well as any kind of expository mode. Like if I write a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, by the way, I'm so happy someone read that. Um, it's different from writing an ethnography, it's different from sitting here in front of you. Um, but I think all of those modes of thinking can be informed by uh, anthropology, and I'll just say, or ethnography, uh, that method of just, I mean, anthropology is pretty cool discipline because it's probably the only one where you can get a PhD just by sitting around and, you know, hanging around with people, which I think is a bit of a scam, but I loved it, you know. <laughs> Now, uh, just one thing about uh, this, this question of how to be most effective. I don't think, if we had the answer to that question, we would not see, you know, endemic rights abuses, right? If we had been so effective, we, I, it's hard to measure effectiveness, right? But I will, I will say this, one of the missing pieces, I think, and this is why I'm honored to be um, invited here by the university, one of the missing pieces in the rights um, approach is, first of all, to think of it as an approach as opposed to many complementary approach. Another one is we really need to be pragmatic about what people tell us, right? And when I'm sitting in a clinic or hanging around as an ethnographer, um, people always talk to me about the same things. They're, you know, they're sick, they're in pain, they're kid and when they feel better because we did something pragmatic, the very thing they asked us to do, which was to listen to them and then provide them some service, then we hear about where well, their kids aren't in school and they don't have a job, right? And 
that piece, just like a research university is ambivalent about the service to community piece, the rights approach has been very ambivalent about the pragmatics of social and economic rights in the past. Right? It's been a legally dominated profession with a very limited set of interventions, just like medicine has its own limited set of interventions, just like public health does. And I think the real power that we're unlocking, especially in the past decade, is this integrative approach that Han mentioned of understanding how civil and political rights are related to poverty, to social and economics. So they're integrally related. People cannot enjoy rights if they're coughing up their lungs or, you know, drop dead during you know, the third trimester of pregnancy because they don't have obstetrics. They just, you can't enjoy rights if you, if you don't have, you know, enough to get by and these basic protections. Or you can't enjoy them for long or your family members can't enjoy them. So I think that's where the real effectiveness of our powerful movement, the rights movement, is moving. That's where it's going to move forward. When we, we stop having these balkanized arguments about civil and political versus social and economic rights, you know, domestic versus international. Um, it's, all of these are traps, analytic traps, and I struggle with them. And uh, that's another reason why I'm here tonight, just like how often do I, you know, do you get to sit down and talk about the complexities of work like this? Not often enough. So I thank you, you know, again for having me. I'm very honored to be back here. Certainly grateful to be in the company of um, my pal, for 30 years, an editor, and, and uh, really thank you, Susan, for inviting me here. Thank you, thank Paul you. Farmer.